Let's move on to our speaker for tonight. So Dr. Curtis Bonk. When I talked to uh, Dr. Bonk, he said, you know, when he introduced me, don't just like read my bio. He has 22 bios. If you go to his website, I, I might be counting wrong. It might be more, but he has three word bios. He does stuff. Uh, I, I, look at his website. That's what they say. So they range from about three words to probably several hundred. And he said, you know, it's kind of embarrassing when somebody sits up there and they talk about um, a bio that maybe, you know, some of the things are years old and they're just, you know, reading. So he said, you know, why don't you do something different? So, all right, I'm going to do something different and I have, have some notes. So uh, Kurt hasn't seen this and I hope I don't embarrass him, but frankly, I think he's pretty creative and engaging and hopefully, hopefully you like this. So here's the traditional bio. The traditional, I'm walking away from my mic here, sorry. Traditional bio is, you know, he's professor, he's an author, he's a trainer, he's a consultant, he's an entrepreneur, runs his own company. You know, you can read that about him. But what I'm going to do is, you know, through social media today, you can learn a lot about somebody. Now, you can't verify the research because I really haven't interviewed Dr. Bonk in, in great detail, but I thought I'd give it a stab and did, I'm going to do kind of a pictorial graphic um, bio here. So I did some research through social media. And here's what I found out about Kurt. He's a snappy dresser. <laughs> he likes the water, and he's, he's, def he's definitely a thinker. He has a really big house. <laughs> but he, he, I'm, I'm suspecting that cutting that grass on the weekends is uh, kind of a challenge. It's amazing how much house you can buy in Indiana for your money. <laughs> now, he has a great consulting gig with a major uh, food producer, but they don't pay him any money. He has a great bartering agreement, and they give him use of, of a car. So, you know, it kind of works out for him. And then he also collaborates. Kurt's a big collaborator. He collaborates with a lot of people. In quadrant number one, we see him there with some real live learning agents, the pink and blue people. And then he has a research grant from NASA, and he's got the, the grant was to see if blue people learn better than non-blue people. <laughs> In, in number three, um, I think that's experiential role playing in a learning context. Either that or he was going to a Ravens game and he wearing a lot of purple. And number four, I know he's a football fan and I'm really impressed that he knows Brett Favre personally. <laughs> that's not Brett Favre in case you didn't know. And you know, he's gone through some career changes in his life. Dr. Bong actually started out uh, in the financial world, as CPA and a, and a corporate controller, which, you know, knowing what he's like, I can't imagine him working in a job like that. Maybe he'll talk about that a little bit. But he's had other career changes where, you know, he's been a Jedi, Jedi Knight. He's been, uh, you know, an explorer, Indiana Jones, Dr. Evil, Merlin the Magician. He's a self proclaimed slacker. And I think he's doing either a Johnny Depp imp uh, impression here, or that's a pirate imitation. So he's, he's had different careers. Um, then, in a search for more meaning in his life, he did a six-month stint on Broadway as Tevian in Fiddler on the Roof. Um, he's been training, actually, a secret ambition I think Kurt has. He's been training his whole life either to be a male dancer in the ballet or an NFL referee. I, 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 I couldn't decide which, but you, you see a lot of that. You know, sometimes I just don't have words to describe this. So, you know, if you follow our field, there's people like um, Gar Reynolds and Nancy Duarte who talk about let the pictures tell the story. So I'm going to let the picture tell, tell the story. I'm not sure what story it is, but anyway, so we had a little fun at Kurt's expense. Hopefully um, he's not, is he, is he laughing? <laughs> All right. So here, here's what I think about my research about Kurt. He's a doer. He gets out there and does things. He's creative. He's engaging. He's entertaining. He's a risk taker. He likes to push the envelope. He likes to do new things. He likes to involve the audience. And he has fun doing it. You know, what's, what's wrong with that? If you're going to do these things, you might as well have fun doing it. So ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce to you Dr. Kurt Bonk. Thank you for roasting me. Um, <laughs> some more tea. Okay. Oh, 
it's not often you get roasted before you speak, you know. <laughs> it usually comes after. The tomatoes come, when, you know, after a while. But uh, how many are coming tomorrow? Great, a lot of you are coming tomorrow. We're going to do a five-part master class on various things, and I think there's people still signing up for that. Um, maybe if you were driving the same way we were driving today, two hours to come up from D.C., you thought it was going to be four hours the way it looked for a while, you decide to stay tonight and just <laughs> not, <laughs> not go back. Uh, anybody frustrated with the traffic today coming up? I'm just kind of get a sense of who's, keep your arms up in the air there. Uh, here's a little smiley face for you and uh, the gentleman over there. There you go. And my smiley face has been all around a lady. A lady who's been frustrated. Yeah, the red shirt on way, way back. I'm not Brett Favre, so you'll have to find that. Okay. So now we do need to get this uh, reconnected up here. Do we have it? Oh, there we go. Great. Yeah, um, I'm happy. You know, I'm really, despite the traffic, and um, uh, where's Sheila, who brought me up here? Right in the front row, Sheila Jacob Nathan from the World Bank. Thank her for bringing me up here. Give her a round of applause. For She's the e-learning expert in D.C. If you wanted, we tried figuring out. She was asking me all the way up for two hours. Well, who's the e-learning expert in Washington D.C.? And we couldn't come up with any names, so it's got to be her, you know. So, um, you know, so if you want to know the answer to anything, she knows everyone pretty much around the world working for the World Bank. Uh, she has to meet pretty much everyone in, in, all around the world who's doing things with e-learning, uh, not just within D.C. But I'm happy uh, since the first time I met Sheila, you know, seven, eight years ago, there's a lot of change that's been going on in education, a lot of innovation that's been going on. I'm going to try and map out some of those things for you today. Uh, and while we're uh, presenting and talking and so forth, we'll have uh, you asking some questions, maybe in the middle, maybe towards the end. I have a couple books to give away uh, for best questions, some shirts and other things. Um, so a little uh, behavioral reinforcement. Um, if you want those slides, she had the talk for the original slides to download. If you want to get a copy of the color PDF of the slides, there's a simple website called trainingshare.com. So if you want to follow along with just, if you didn't get that URL, if you don't want to download those slides, which takes a little while. I did notice some people downloading. It showed up on my computer. Um, but if you don't want to download, if you just want to get the color PDFs, trainingshare.com, archive talks. You can get all five talks I'm doing tomorrow and tonight's talk already up there. And my publications are at publicationshare.com. So you have to believe in the power of sharing, I guess, is the point on all of this. The world is open. I'm not a referee. The world's open for learning. So um, we're going we're to do something called stretching the edges here. Stretching the edges. And you know, I'm not a magician, although maybe we could try. You know, we're going to stretch away. You know, you've heard of blended learning, right? How many of you have heard of blended? Hybrid learning, those in the military like hybrid. It means the interbreeding of two or more species of animals to create a mongrel. OK, we'll leave that with the military folks. Um, Sheila's got a chapter in my 2006 handbook of blended learning. That's uh, you know, low risk, low cost, low time, small things you can do. So we're going to start with, um, in the second half of the talk, I'll give 13 ideas for blended learning. In the, in the middle after that, I'll give uh, 13 ideas for transforming your class, tottering, tinkering, tottering to totally extreme learning. And then in the end, we'll get into the extreme side, way out there in the far edges we're going to stretch out to. And um, that's where my research is right now, on extreme learning and what extreme learning is. And we'll start dipping our toes into what that means. Learning from a boat, learning from a plane, learning from, uh, you know, in the car as we're driving up. Anything not school. And I think that's where we're headed, actually. That's where society's heading. If you look at MIT content free on the world, to the world, who would have thought that 10 years ago? that MIT would let every course of theirs available for free, or Johns Hopkins down the road here, putting a lot of their courses up, or Tufts, or whatever. That's just a part of it, of open educational resources that's available today. So I'm going to go through, before we get to those 13, 13, 39 examples, and tomorrow I'll give 120 some examples of and activities you can integrate technology in classrooms. So we're going to, those coming tomorrow, we're going to do about five times as many things. Um, and before we do that, I'm going to go through the last year, year and a half of what's happened in the news. I'm going to go through some technologies that are confronting us every day and try and get us up uh, so we can see what's going on in the news. And today's news, you know, and yesterday's news, a lot happening in the technology fronts. Anyone think about getting the new iPhone, right? Yeah. You know, there's all sorts of new technologies springing up every day coming at us, and I'm happy. I'm happy, I'm, you know, there is a change. There's a distinct change that has happened to move us from shovelware 
on the web to getting us to think about interactive, engaging, collaborative environments. And you know, working with the Army Research Institute and the Department of Defense a decade ago, when I saw you know, them trying some simulations and animations and other things out that people weren't ready for yet, and most people were just plopping up their face-to-face -face courses on the web. Today, you're not the only ones happy, my dog's happy. <laughs> and my dog's happy because, heck, he can get a degree online, right? <laughs> you know, so, um, you know, who is on the other end? Is it a kangaroo on the other end when you're doing synchronous training with Adobe Connect or, or Illuminate or some other technology tool? You know, my dogs are extremely happy today. And um, I do have audio, and it didn't, um, I didn't hear it on there, so um, let's see if we've got uh, audio cue here. I did have it up earlier. Let me just, that's on there, so. Um, the gentleman who's the helper here want to check on audio? There we go. Thank you. OK. Well, a month ago, I was in Korea. I was at um, Iwa Women's University. And the first time I went to Iwa Women's University nine years ago, um, I was with my son, who's born in Korea, actually. And we, we, went, we were there for the World Cup. And we were invited to Iwa Women's. I was going to give a speech there. And my driver said, oh, thank you, Dr. Bog. Thank you for letting me drive you in this two hours of hell just like uh, it was today um, coming up from DC. I said, why are you thanking me? There's cars just merging from all over the place, six lanes of traffic going into three. So thank you, Dr. Bunk. Thank you, Dr. Bunk, for letting me come with you. And I said, oh, why, Mu Young? And he says, because I couldn't get there otherwise. This is a women's university. And so, <laughs> you know. But this was built by a French architect since uh, 2002, my first arrival. And you go down the path. These are buildings people work in on the side. It's a very fascinating place going in there. But as you exit Iwa Women's, you head to Yonsei University, which is the most prestigious university in all of Korea. Yonsei University has a unique library. And as I walk through campus, most people walk the other way, but as I walk through campus, you see the library right in the middle. And it's got four levels. Each level of the building represents a different type of learning. There's social learning happening on the first floor, where they're learning English through interactive games. Okay. There's um, collaborative learning taking place on the second floor. And they have collaboration stations, actually, all throughout. And a lot of touch screens to find your way throughout the building. Individual workstations on the third floor. So you're getting a lot of contents that have been put up on the web for you to learn at a self-paced variety. And you have individual counseling sessions on the fourth floor. So you have specific rooms for collaboration. Now, this is not only happening in Korea at Yonsei University. It's happening all around the world. As I go to Glasgow Caledonian University in Glasgow, <laughs> in Scotland, you fly over the top of the building and it explains what kind of learning is taking place inside that day. People are not only rethinking the types of learning taking place virtually, this push the past decade has also gotten us to rethink classroom space, physical spaces for learning. We're trying to create active learning centers. As I interviewed last year directors of e-learning at the University of Minnesota and Iowa and George Mason and Central Florida, they're talking about active learning centers on each of their campuses. Here, you've got bean bag chairs in the first floor, social learning, Barnes and Noble kind of learning, not borders, but Barnes and Noble, <laughs> right? In the second floor, you have other kinds of learning, and on the third floor, counseling and so forth. As you, again, people are thinking and rethinking library spaces. In fact, Campus Technology Magazine, which used to be called The Syllabus, it's free. If you how many get Campus Technology? A lot of you probably do. They had a special issue about classroom spaces a few months ago, and then another special issue on it. They had one last summer, and then another one this summer. Because Abilene Christian University, which gives away iPhones to all incoming students, is rethinking their classroom spaces for mobile learning. Oklahoma Christian University gives Mac laptop airs and an iPhone to every incoming student. Interesting what's happening on college campuses to entice students to show up, but they're rethinking space. What I'm finding, though, is that classroom space, now, you might have seen the movie A Vision of Today's Student by Michael Resch, or The Machine is Us Using Us. You might have heard about Michael Resch at Kansas State, a cultural anthropologist, became famous. 10 million people have watched this video, how students hold up sign up, what percent read the books and all that. Have you seen that video? How many have seen? I was on their campus last week and took a picture of the building. It's an ugly old building that he's in, and the classroom. 
but they showed me all these new spaces Kansas State's building. They're thinking about using them. Uh, at Indiana, we've built new spaces and no one's using them. They're trying to coerce faculty into going there. But the students are migrating to the libraries today because they want the Barnes and Noble feel, uh, feel to it. They want to be catered to. They want that space that's theirs individually as well as socially. They want that social space like a Facebook and a MySpace, but they also want that reflection space. They want both, in effect. And there's actually videos up. Royal Holloway University in University of London has um, a video explaining their learning situation. Um, we've got universities in Michigan explaining how their university has been revamped for learning, trying to foster more learning on the college campus. As we look at these classroom spaces, we see that the technologies are ubiquitous. They're wrapped around the student all the time. They're on the walls, okay, sharing their work. They bring in their laptops for and plug into cyber ports or mobile. But classroom space is being rethought, I guess is my main point. We're moving away from didactic learning. And um, you know, I used to be in the Catholic school as a young kid, and you know, this was pretty much the way it was. And if I wasn't doing that, I'd be slapped, you know, uh, if I wasn't paying attention, you know. Uh, but today, these kind of spaces are falling by the wayside, and we're seeing more social and collaborative learning. These guys at Dubai Men's College, or these kids in India, are socializing around the technology. The iPad has become a technology that's not just for individuals, but a social space. How many of you have an iPad? How many of you ever shown someone what you're doing on your iPad? Unlike a personal computer, you rarely show what you're working on, but an iPad becomes something that's social and engaging. Now these kids are using the pocket school project where your teacher's in your pocket. You have a teacher all the time. My friend Paul Kim at Stanford has been going around the world with this program where you have literacy training in math uh, and in science and in Spanish and English and languages where migrant workers in Mexico have their kids with this MP3 player in their pocket all the time to be learning from. So when they don't have a school, they don't have teachers they can be learning. And social entrepreneurship's happening where kids in Rwanda are telling stories about the war in 1994 when all the people were killed. And those stories are sold as iPhone app apps. And that money comes back to the community. Okay? People are rethinking spaces for learning. Where does learning happen? It doesn't just happen in a classroom. And if it is happening in a classroom, these are not the same classrooms. These are different kinds of classroom spaces that are emerging today. So the spaces for learning are not just changing uh, in a virtual cyber world, they're changing in the physical world. So we can't ignore the change that's happening. We can decide how we're going to provide the learning on our campuses. Paul Kim points out that mobile learning is expanding around the world. As you can see, mobile learning within North America, no problem, much of Europe, Australia, and so forth, and now finally expanding within Asia. 15% only in most Asian countries have access but that's doubling uh, during the next couple of years. More than half the population has a mobile phone. You know, more than three billion, four billion people have mobile phones, so they're trying to provide training on those mobile devices. I think uh, Zane Burgi, who's here on this campus, is doing an edited book right now. We're having dinner tomorrow night. He's collecting stories from around the world on mobile learning. It'd be a fascinating book when he comes out. He is actually, if you talk about leaders in the field of e-learning, Zane would be one of the people. How many, how many of you know Zane here? I'm almost there, I'm speaking in the choir. Is Zane here? He's hiding in the back. Uh, Paul went off to Argentina with my son last month, and they worked with indigenous populations of northern Argentina with mobile devices, smartphones. And these kids immediately took to them. They understood them. And he walks in to Argentina. He walks into kids in Palestine. He walks into kids in Dominican Republic uh, and in Rwanda and India. And he says, I'm, you know, I don't know what happened, but aliens gave me these mobile devices. How do I use them? And he drops them off, and the kids to, you know, explore and then share how they're learning on them. He calls it alien pedagogy. <laughs> you know. And so these kids don't take five minutes to figure out how to, how to get educational content from them, how to interact with it. It doesn't take long. They not, might not have ever seen them before. That's August 2000, that's last month. Okay, let's look at the past year or a little over the past year. September 2010, Barbara Means from Stanford Research Institute came out with a report. And if you've got people who are critiquing online learning or blended learning, have them download this report. 
evaluation of evidence-based practices in online learning, a meta-analysis and review of online learning studies. Type that in Google, it's free. It's a revised report. What it shows is that blended learning and fully online learning have higher results than face-to-face. -face. Now, it does depend on how the, those courses are developed and designed. It can't just be shovelware on the web. There has to be interaction and collaboration. There's some caveats there. But they studied over 200 reports and distilled them. Now, Bob Wisher at the Advanced Distributed Learning Lab down in DC had a report in 2002 showing similar things. But back in 2002, there weren't 200 studies. He only had 15 that he could compare. But take a look at this report. It's one report. It's got me happy. At least there's some sense you know, that it's, not, it's beyond no significant difference. It actually shows some significant differences, OK? We keep hearing the Russell report about no significant difference over and over again. Well, here we've got some. The following month, I was happy because I finished up 27 videos on how to teach online. And these videos are free for all of you to use. My dean, so let's make it, make it free to the world. Let anyone around the world use. It's at a website and YouTube called Travel and Ed Man. And we did a video on planning an online class, managing an online class, uh, re reducing plagiarism, assessment, building community, blended learning, podcasts, wikis, blogs, um, collaborative learning, um, archiving your class, global collaboration. Uh, we had a dean who said, no, let's not put this on the web. And he, um, he moved, fortunately. And he got replaced by uh, my former department chair. My department chair says, Kurt, let's, let's put all these on the web for free and let people not only download them, not only share them, they can remix them, and you can sell them. All you have to do is credit, put our name somewhere on there. So um, we put a pretty, create, uh, pretty liberal Creative Commons license on these. It's in the V portal, the video primers in an online repository of e-teaching and learning. But just type in uh, Google, YouTube, Travel and Edman, and you should find them if you're interested. That's October. December rolls around, and Mark Zuckerberg's name type magazine's person of the year. It was about time. Um, the movie, how many of you like the movie? Too short, right? Too many attorneys, but otherwise OK. February comes around, and my friend Julie Young says, Kurt, I know you've been tracking the Florida virtual school since 1995 when we had 12 students. Since that time, we've now got over 100,000 students. This is half credit hours, over 200,000. Over 100,000 students. It's the largest K-12 school in the world. Florida's trying to mandate K-12 online learning. State of Michigan has mandated every kid from Michigan has to have one online class to get a high school degree. State of North Carolina has gone from nobody learning online to over 60,000 in three years because they have the Learn and Earn project, where if you go to high school for five years, you get an associate degree. Okay? These kids are going to show up here at UMBC. They're going to show up in Indiana, where I am, expecting online environments, or at least blended of some kind. They're having these experiences now. We're pushing down the edges. We're stretching the edges. It's no longer just happening in corporate training. It's no longer just happening in the Army in the Navy or in higher ed. It's going downwards to middle school and high school. We've gone from about 200,000 learning online in middle school, high school five years ago to millions of kids today for many reasons, being bullied, you know, kids who might be pregnant, kids looking for advanced placement, trying to catch up, all sorts of reasons, expat kids and so forth. February 4th, February 16th, two bills made the news. Bill Gates says, my favorite teacher is Salman Khan from the Khan Academy. A Khan Academy, now this guy's got what, five master's degrees from MIT and Harvard, literally. And he was training his nieces and nephews in, ba in Bangladesh and in India and here in the States in algebra, in geometry, chemistry, biology, physics. And these videos went viral. Have they haven't seen the Khan Academy, 2,000 videos. Now Gates is putting up money for assessments and badges. This is the new trend today is have badges for your learning and the corporate sectors going to be endorsing badges. They're going to say certificates might not be needed. P uh, diplomas might not be needed. Badges might be what's needed. Anyways, he says favorite teacher. That's February 16th. Same day, Bill Clinton flew a plane to Chicago for a, an e-learning technology-based conference. He says, I don't want to miss out on this. Typical Bill Clinton. I don't want to miss out on this. Heck, I know nothing about technology, but I'm here anyways. <laughs> now, a month earlier, he sent me a thank you note for sending him a copy of My World is Open book. Apparently, he didn't learn much from it. But it wasn't that good of a book. A few weeks later, Steve Jobs makes an announcement about the iPad coming out, iPad 2, right? Coming out. And there we go. 
that you know, tablet computers are exploding right all over the place. People are using for physics and for chemistry and for language learning and all sorts of content uh, based learning on these mobile devices, this tweener device, somewhere between a phone and a computer. Um, it's an interesting new market that he's created all by himself. Following month, I was at the ADRA conference in New Orleans and flew home to I Indianapolis. When I got home, there was a conference for math, National um, Council for, for Math Teachers, NCTM. And at the NCTM, National Council of Teachers of Math, they had a project called iSmart, Integration of Science, Math, and Reflective Teaching from the University of Houston. And my former student Mimi Lee and her friend Jen Chaveau were presenting and they created a free master's degree. Now they became a Research One University recently. How many Research One universities have free master's degrees? Not many, but this is happening. There's a trend, right? Okay, huge changes are happening. Um, they have one for middle school math teachers in the state of Texas, okay? Later in that month, I was at the University of North Texas, and before my keynote, I was sitting in the back of the room watching the royal wedding. You know, Prince uh, William and Kate getting married on the royal channel. Now, the queen knows her legacy is in the royal channel. She knows her legacy is going to be in YouTube, so her coronation's in there. All sorts of Prince William and Henry's events are in there. Uh, much of the history and culture of England is in the royal channel. And the queen goes to Google to upload videos. They show her going to, and, and the Dalai Lama has a Twitter feed and a podcast show. <laughs> and Barack has his Blackberry, right? Well, we've got Barack with a Blackberry, the Dalai Lama with a Twitter feed, right? And his podcast show and her uploading to YouTube. If they can do it, you can do it. <laughs> Anybody can be doing this stuff, right? Think about it. What kind of channel can you create? What change can you make within all this? What contribution will you make? Now. I was talking to military people down in Newport News, Virginia, back in May, and the Defense Acquisition University in DC gave me some numbers. You can see the growth of the DAU over the past decade. And the growth is happening in the classroom from 28,000 students a decade ago to 45, but online, on the web, they've gone from 13 to 192,000. Huge growth on the web, okay? We're still growing in the classroom settings, but it's a number, and, and this guy's their millionth learner. Million people. Now, sounds like a lot. And Gandhi University in India has two million students. 100,000 in each MBA cohort. In fact, 10 of the largest 13 universities in the world are in Asia. The Open U of, of Malaysia grew from nobody in 2000 to 100,000 today. They're growing by 10,000 a year. It's a huge growth happening, stretching the edges again all around the world. Open U of Indonesia, 600,000 students. They, they were started 30 years ago. We all know about the Open U in the UK, hundreds of thousands there as well. July, smartphones are the place. Now, I have a dumb phone. I was in Korea a month ago. So what kind of dumb phone is that? You know, I said it's a keyboard and all this kind of stuff. And you know, um, and Sheila just sent me a note saying your talk's got to improve. Thanks, Sheila. Um, it's got to get better, thanks. I, you know, okay. So um, I'm standing in front of the slides, I think she said or something. So, um, <laughs> So, you know, my friend um, Ellen Wagner says she once gave a talk, and while she was giving a talk, someone texted her that, about a blog post that someone was doing about her talk, and anyhow, <laughs> small. <laughs> hey, smartphones are on these, on these you know, smart, have your lecture notes. You can be learning all the time in your car, in your train, in your van, wherever you happen to be. You know, I was in Korea with my dumb phone. I said, what that kind of phone is this? I said, you make this in Korea, but you give, give it to us in the U.S. So we're, we're, you know. August, the following month, Inkling announces, hey, you know, we've got 4.5 billion spent on textbooks last year. This year, 3% of books are going to be sold that are digital. But by 2017, almost half. This is a huge, we're going to go from, you know, a few hundred million dollars of digital book sales to probably 2 billion sales during the next five years. So no wonder textbook companies are afraid, are interested at the same time, right? And forming partnerships. A couple, couple weeks later, Boston Consulting Group sent me a report they had done after interviewing myself and others about the growth of online learning in higher ed. And you can see the growth is not dissipating anytime soon. Now, there's still people who are contesting that, you know, online is not the way to go. It's kind of like I got the lights in front of me here in my eyes. It's like deer in the headlights, right? Kind of syndrome, okay? But soon there'll be roadkill, okay? <laughs> 
No, I don't. I actually think that of the 3,862 universities and colleges in the U.S., most will still exist, and they could still exist without online. We're just going to need more. If you've got half, well, if you've got billions of people wanting education, somebody's going to be providing that in some way, shape, or form. We're going to need more educational outlets, not less. I'm not that worried about job security. I'm worried about its sanity, about trying to, trying to get education to all the people that are going to ask for it, actually, during the coming decades. There's going to be a lot of new roles for each of us to play out. Now at IU, we created IU Connect Ed. It's a great name. The School of Education created it. IU administrators wanted it, and our dean wouldn't give it to them. It's a long little story there. But we've now got a EDD on the web in educational technology, the first, or one of the first branded EDDs. Pepperdine has one. Old Dominion has one. Um, those of you in Virginia, uh, there are a few out there. But we have a certificate, a master's degree, and now we're going to get an adult ed we have just going to acquire within my programs. Just in one program, we're going to have four different degrees on the web. And we wouldn't exist as a program without online learning. We have some considered the top instructional systems technology program in the country. If a decade ago we had not embraced online, we would not exist. OK? Simple as that. We'd be gone. We'd be toast. Um, and that was, that was April and August. We had two announcements. August 25th, brain games were announced from uh, Luminicity and Mind Sparkle, where you can keep your brain active as you get older playing online games. Alan Bushnell, who created Atari and then Chuck E. Cheese Pizza, he's now created a company to do similar kinds of things. Uh, and this is an exploding area and one that we'll all be thankful for in the not too distant future, and maybe already are. September 12th, the day after seven, uh, September 11th, um, I flew home on September 11th from Korea and I got, got home and I found out that IU formed a partnership with various companies to bring down the cost of these digital books, to expand the access of digital books so they don't evaporate in six months. Students can continue to access them after the semester ends. You know, was that mission impossible? At the end of the tape, it was self-destruct, just like most of these books do. Now, in 2000, I had a book, a textbook, and my students said, Dr. Bunk, your book's an e-book. <laughs> I said, no, it's not. What have you been drinking? No, Dr. Bonk, it's an e-book. And I said, well, I'm a co-author, and I'm an instructor using it. And lo and behold, it was an e-book, and the publishers never even told me. That was the state of e-books a decade ago. We'd hear one year, it's the year of the e-book. The next year, it's not. It was back and forth. Now, we've got 5 10% of books being e-books, soon 15 20. We've hit that tipping point. And now we're going to force to think about incorporating e-books in our classes. I have a course on the web 2.0, 52 pages, everything's an open access link. They pick and choose. I'm their guide in the course. I'm a concierge. We become concierges in our teaching. It's probably the best metaphor I can think of, or expedition leaders. The same day, there are different announcements about schools adapting iPads. Many schools today are jumping in, getting iPads for all kids at a certain grade, certain age level. Uh, these are kids in New Jersey. Uh, Abilene Christian University had an announcement that iPads made a difference in student comprehension scores. Mobile learning with iPhones plus iPads had them asking questions at deeper levels, had them exploring more, becoming better at search skills, okay, and other things. That was September 18th. <laughs> Holy cow! S September 25th comes around, and my friend Martin, the Moodle man. <laughs> Holy cow! And um, the, the Brewers did make the playoffs, not the Cubs, thankfully. Anyhow, um, that's Harry Carey, if you recognize. That's Martin, who developed Moodle. If you, anyone use Moodle? Now, Martin is self-trained in the outback of Australia. And he was a WebCT instructional designer and hated WebCT. And so he developed Moodle. And in 2002, he met me in, actually in Hawaii. And uh, he asked me if I'd like to partner with him. And I said, no. I had built a survey tool. And I said, no. And I made a big mistake. <laughs> like everything in my life, um, big mistake. But you know, everyone's using Moodle. We've got 220, 212 countries, 56,000 sites, 46 million people, almost 5 million classes. We've got Muppets using Moodle. Uh, we've got uh, Mel Gibson, Smiley Faces, Yoda, dogs and cats. Everybody's using Moodle. You know, this is a huge trend today. You know, in fact, Sheila was asking me coming up here, is there a tool that competes? Now, in Indiana, we have Sakai. Chef Sakai, the Iron Chef on television. 
Michigan had built the CHEF tools, the collaborative higher education framework, and Michigan, Indiana, MIT, and Stanford each gave two million bucks to create something free to the world. And someone at Michigan said, let's call it Sakai, Chef Sakai, and so they did. And they overpromised and underdelivered. and this is being taped, my uh, administrators are gonna be killing me, on my, anyhow, it's now, a, it's now a viable technology. Sakai is actually really good and I'm using it this semester. It took five or six years beyond what they promised, anyhow. This week in the news, someone sent me this New York Times article, and I wrote to the author this week, we've corresponded, the University of Wherever, basically talking about the fact that learning can happen any place around the world, with, through iTunes or through the Khan Academy or whatever. We can always be learning. This is the learning century that we're in. Make no mistake about it, in 2060, somebody's going to turn around. It's the age of globalization, most certainly. But if it's not this century, it'll be the following one. It'll be the, the century of learning constantly learning all the time. We're going to have to, to compete. We're going to have to, to keep our minds sane, you know, because of all the opportunities that lay in front of each one of us. When, hang, when guys on hang gliders get in accidents and are laid up in hospitals, and they sit there, and they explore the MIT contents on the web and Yale contents and decide to go back to graduate school or undergraduate and get their English degrees, like one grocery store manager did last year. And there are many such stories out there where people are laid up for a while and explore. Free stuff on the web is not necessarily for a degree, it's for finding new interests, finding new occupations, making sense of your own life. It's not just about free access to contents and getting degrees and diplomas, it's about pushing through with your life, developing in your life. Well, he was talking about that, Bill Keller talked about that. You can get that New York Times article free on the web. The day after that, my city, front page news, iPads for kids in MCCSC schools, Monroe County School District. And they talk about special needs. This is going to actually most of the students that um, are in low SES districts getting these uh, to help them out, bring them up uh, in terms of reading, math, and other scores. Of course, yesterday we had an announcement, right? USA Today announces the iPhone 4S. Again, I didn't see any hands. Anyone getting this? One person. Okay, it's being panned. I wonder if it came out. Why did this particular technology come out then at the time? Um, well, it could be because they knew Steve Jobs was at the end of the line and they were trying to make an announcement before he did die and pass away yesterday. But this is big front page news yesterday, right? And so what happens when we have this as front page news, uh, Steve Jobs' death, and it goes through his life on the web. When you open the article up, you get a timeline of his life. Now, I'm going to show you later this timeline they had been building already. They had an announcement in August. But as you click across the timeline, you get different activities of Bill Gates' life coming at you, what he was known for. So if you want to actually understand your own life in a different way, you can. And so you can think about what things that, get, that, uh, that Steve Jobs developed, or, and there's one for Bill Gates, too, when he retired. Uh, but these timeline tools are fascinating ways to think about encapsulating knowledge. If someone asks me what's powerful about the web, well, feedback from around the world is, but so is concept mapping and, and timelining, just trying to get a, a timeline of history, hyperhistory, or fashion design, or computer science, or whatever the field might be. My field, instructional technology, we have a timeline for my department. You understand it so much better by exploring it on the web. Again, this talk is about stretching the edges, okay? Stretching the edges here a little bit. So I'm gonna ask for you to turn to someone next to you and give, give Steve Jobs his 99 seconds of, of, that he's due and reflect a bit about how Steve Jobs has impacted your life and pushed you beyond where you would have been without him. How has he stretched the edges, either as an instructor or, per, or personally back at home? So turn to someone, introduce yourself, and be back in 99 seconds.
Test, test, test. How many people in here, and um, I got my mic back on, how many people have been impacted by Steve Jobs? In the whole world, I mean, some person, you know. And what, anyone have an example of how they've been impacted by Steve Jobs? So, something you heard from someone else? Yeah. I got my first iPhone. You got your first iPhone? I was when? Last month. Last month. Um, how about I give you your first T-shirt from UMBC? Someone want to pass? <laughs> I don't want to hit the lady in the head, but let's give it a shot. Oh, almost. Anyone else? Yes. Well, my great son-in-law here and daughter, they have a two-year-old. And about six months ago, uh, she got us interested in the iPad. And there's this two-year-old sitting there. Hey, did you do this? Show me that. Oh, what are those colors? You know, she didn't even talk yet. Oh, my God. <laughs> so from a learning standpoint, it is just like unbelievable. The stuff that she can do now, like two and a half, is just mind-blowing. When you think about 40 years ago, what two and a half-year-olds did and were doing, they're doing today. Amazing. Here, we'll give you those UMBC hats. There you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah sure. Anyone else? Yeah. I was speaking. In 1989, I had my first Macintosh computer. I had an amazing, huge hard drive, 80 megabytes. <laughs> now I think my laptop is, I don't know, so many gigabytes, I don't even count that high. <laughs> You know, in uh, 1978, I was an accounting major, and I give you a word. Who are, here we go. Give you a million dollars here to buy some more Apple products. There, you know. Um, in 1978, I was taking an accounting finance a finance class, and the example was this small company, Apple Computer, has this amount of assets and liabilities. I still remember this. You know, how many decades later? Um, I think I was eight years old at the time. <laughs> Okay, let's go back to Steve. So, I mean, times have changed. And part of it are pe people can change the world. One person can make a difference, and each of us can. Anatomy professors in Penn, Penn State University have changed the world, make a website on the muscular system for 200 students in the class. And 250,000 students in one month use that website to bone up on anatomy. All right? One person can change the world. I got my friend Lucifer. How many of you have friends named Lucifer? <laughs> My friend Lucifer, talk about him in the world is open book. He uh, translated Lord of the Rings to Chinese at age 26 and made a million dollars right before the movies came out. Smart man. Unfortunately, ladies, he got married last month. He's now translating The Hobbit. And this first one just went to mainland China, uh, to, to tai Taiwan. Now this is coming to mainland China. He took half that money and he's translating MIT contents free to the world because there's a billion people that could learn from that. It's the OOPS project, open source, open course for a prototype system. He's the janitor of OOPS. He cleans up the messes in the translation. He wears black. He's a tall Chinese guy with long hair. Interesting guy, interesting fellow. Was living with his mom until a month ago. Anyhow, <laughs> anyhow. it's a lot happening out here. I see this flashing at me, so we're adjusting image here for some reason. I hope this is um, not going to continue to adjust image. But um, you know, let's. Uh, Let's hope that this, this does adjust over time. Okay. So, um, so I'm happy at the state of things. My dog's happy and he's content. Okay, he's happy about the state of things. But my cats aren't quite so content. Nor are my hippopotamus. Or hippopotami. Okay, there's a lot more that we can do. We can move beyond this state of e-learning, right? September 15th, 2010, the same time we had this report about the benefits of blended learning and fully online learning. Of course, here's one of those caveats about um, don't break the flow here. I think I broke the flow. <laughs> you know, Steve Jobs is coming back at us through the machine here because <laughs> I'm using a PC <laughs> instead of a Mac or, you know, unfortunately. So we're getting some adjustments here on the system and we have to take another break for, for a minute and reboot. Apologies. Um, yeah, I don't know what the machine issue. Uh, there, there's the risk when you go to use the 99 second counter. 
It's a simple technology. It always works. Well, um, I highly recommend the 99 second counter and there are other counters. You can give students 99 seconds of time that way and get them to interact. Um, but um, there are other times you decide not to. <laughs> uh, anyways, you know, we, we have all these positive things happening, all these vibes over the past decade, yet we have studies like this coming out of um, Florida, University of Florida. One study looking at students who learned through video on the web compared to students who learned face-to-face -face who also got the video on the web. The students who got face-to-face -face plus the video on the web scored one point higher than the students who got only the video at home who didn't have good computer access and the media blew it out of proportion. Now I'm a product of distance learning. I took correspondence and TV courses to get out of accounting and get into graduate school. And to me, I don't care if I scored one point lower as long as I got out of the cube farms I was in. Um, you know, but, but the media tends to blow up either the positives or the negatives. And it's just one study. So part of the reason I'm not content, you know, while we have 200 studies summarized by Stanford, one study can still show something with one point difference. Okay, fine. Um, Clay Shirky at NYU says, hey, this is a revolution happening. Here comes other people to crowdsource content in Wikipedia. Now, Jimmy Wales dropped out of my university to create Wikipedia, so I tell my students, drop out and make a name for yourself. <laughs> Clay Shirky has a book called, you know, Kind of Surplus. Well, Nicholas Carr has his book out there, The Shallows, what the internet's doing to our brains. And his article is Google making us stupid. And he says, we are becoming squirrels. We're putting things on our flash memory sticks and soon terabyte sticks for a rainy day. We're not reading everything. We store things for later, just like squirrels do, right? So that's a problem. We're not becoming readers, thoughtful thinkers. We're not delving in deeply about what's around us. We're squirrels. <laughs> and he wants owls for some reason, OK? But there's all these technologies wrapped around us. In fact, the Google guys want us to implant chips in our brains. So when we think of an idea we need, the search comes out on our mobile devices, on our hands. <laughs> that's Sergey Brin, quote unquote, you know, and, and Larry Page. That's the goal. Uh, Kathy Davidson at Duke University, you know, Duke gave away iPods for a while, about eight years ago, seven, seven, eight years ago, and didn't have really evaluation around it, whereas Evelyn Christian has an evaluation team, a planning team, you know, a pedagogy team. We've learned from those mistakes, right? And she wrote an article about multitasking. This generation is now multitasking a lot. We're, uh, we're in this age where we do things like squirrels. We store things for a later day. That's how we cope with what's out there, with this information overload. The thousands and thousands of free databases and free courses wrapped around us at all times. And she says, well, who needs this content? Who, who needs access to it for blended or fully online? Is it people in nursing homes? Is it families coming home from work in Korea? Teachers in the outback of Australia or Malaysia, rural teachers getting trained, or kids in high school? It's all that. It's people in the military getting their MBAs in war zones, right? It's people needing retooling who might use Salman Khan's Khan Academy. It might be t people like this who are full-time athletes who go to the Miami High School that specializes for tennis players and uh, golfers and other things. That's their specialty, actually. We have ballerinas and opera singers at the Indiana High School. And the Indiana University High School is in the middle of campus. We have 4,000 students. No one knows it's even there. But soon it could be bigger than Indiana University. If it grows like North Carolina, if it grows like Florida, if it grows like Michigan, it could be, you see. We're stretching the edges downwards, you see. When Salman Khan's Khan Academy gets on NBC and kids around the world are learning their math, autistic kids are finding that it's a resource for them to learn math in a new way. Same with iPads. Special needs kids are finding out the, the use. Their parents are. My daughter worked with a five and six year old kids in Indianapolis last week. I said, Dad, you wouldn't believe these iPads. These kids who aren't communicating at all are communicating through their iPad. Okay? The most famous e-learning person in Bloomington, Indiana is this guy, John Breen. And he doesn't even check his email. But he saw his kids struggling with the SAT exam, so he created a website called the Free Grain of Rice. Now, the Free Grain of Rice, every time you get a vocabulary question correct, 10 grains of rice are donated to Miramar in Nepal. Millions of tons of metric rice have been donated around the world during study periods. He's not only got vocabulary, but Spanish and French and German. And he's got art history 
and he's got math, he's got chemistry. Fascinating. I don't play games, but this side, I was like, wow, you get this feedback. You get the question right, you know. If you knew my score in the ACT is 19, I couldn't even get into Lower Potomac State University, which doesn't even exist, okay? But today I can learn from Stanford and Harvard and MIT and any place around the world that puts up content. At Berkeley stuff's in iTunes. Stanford's is up in YouTube and iTunes as well. See, anyone can learn anything from anyone else at any time today. You know, those in hurricanes, I was going to Houston during Hurricane Ike. They said, no, you're not. We're having a hurricane hit. You're not coming here to give your speech. We've canceled it. Stay home, water boy. So I stay at home. I so asked my friends at Houston, how are you teaching your classes? We're doing blended learning, web-based learning. When Katrina hit, the state of Mississippi and the state of um, Louisiana opened up online learning faucets. They said we can, and Sloan Foundation, that we'll make free classes for these kids at Tulane, right? When SARS hit, China had banned online learning except for a few select universities. They've opened it up when SARS hit. Same in Hong Kong and other places. Same when H1N1 virus went around. All of a sudden, the Smithsonian was putting content up for high school kids so they wouldn't have to go to school. In fact, the state of Ohio is going to ban snow days. Earthquakes. Haiti didn't get a virtual school until after the earthquake. Okay? Western China, my friend Lucifer Chu is translating courses on disaster relief when the earthquake hit. Iceland, I was in the airport, uh, Charles de Gaulle Airport a year and a half ago. We were the last plane out. Everybody left behind were teaching from the concourse. All my friends for two weeks were left back behind, okay? Volcanoes, earthquakes, you name it. SARS, blizzards, snowmageddon here, right? How are people, how are people teaching? here in DC, we interviewed George Mason faculty. They said, we didn't believe in online and blended until Snowmageddon. Now, I'm sure here at UMBC, I heard you have many programs. It's, you know, it's not, you guys already were, okay? Last uh, spring, Groundhog Day, I'm in the airport in Indianapolis. We had that blizzard, ice was in the engine. Our, our jet bridge was stuck to the plane. Wheels were stuck to the ground. After two hours of de-icing, that's de-icing my plane for two hours, it's still stuck. That's how much ice we had, and I still got on the plane. I was brave. <laughs> we found ice in the engines, but any fools who want to get on that plane can. I volunteered, okay? It wasn't as bad as being kidnapped in Saudi Arabia, which, you know, that was another one. I crawled up through the taxi window. But um, that was earlier this year. Anyhow, you never know what's gonna happen. You know, storms are happening all around us. We've got tsunamis, right? We've got tornadoes hitting the, the um, Texas and Alabama. And last week I was in Kansas. Oh, nice in Kansas, everything, but no. It's a twister. It's a twister. Put him up. Put him up. There's a governor. So should we be content? I don't think we should be content when we're reacting to all these situations. We only say and embrace online and blended after a storm, after a health scare. If we're only embracing it because of all these environmental issues that are wrapped around us in health, why aren't we being proactive? Why aren't we thinking ahead about the use of it and where it might be useful and our role within that? Why don't we look at the history of technology and how it's impact people over time? As we click along this timeline from the New York Times about technology, you can find out a lot about, and I, I lost my internet connection because of that, but well, it's okay. Disengage this computer now. Well, we'll ignore our internet things since we lost some time there. But as I click along that timeline, if I were, you would see. Disengage this computer now. I, I shouldn't have done that. Uh, Disengage this computer now. Yeah, it's gonna talk to me. This is my first computer. I worked for a high-tech company in Milwaukee. We, we manufactured circuit boards, highly dense circuit boards. And yet, no one wanted a PC. My boss says, why would someone need a PC, the, the controller, I was assistant controller. Why would someone, I had to work on the weekends on budgets through, um, you know, spreadsheets, Lotus 1, 2, 3, and VisiCalc. And he put it in a desk drawer for no one to read after that. You know, 2,500 bucks, 48K of, of memory. It would hold one PowerPoint slide. <laughs> Commodore 64. The computer can process information, but only the information which is put in. Data insufficient. Never send a human to do a machine's job. How many had a Commodore 64? Two PowerPoint slides, you know, color. <laughs> Mark Weiser, in, you know, 20 years ago, 1991, predicted the iPad. How many things are we predicting today that's going to come out in 20 years? You know, 
he was ahead of his time. He actually died very young, very shortly after this article came out in, in Scientific American. I can see you're really upset about well, this. Think back 10 years. I honestly think you ought to. I know that you were planning to disconnect. Just what do you think you're doing? 10 years ago, I worked with the military. Now, the military, the DOD had this virtual tactical operations center, the VTOC. And they had people in seven different rooms doing collaborative planning, strategic planning, with avatars. You know the movie Avatar? They had these little avatars. Come over to my space. Come over. Come on. Work with me and all this stuff. Um, but they were way ahead. They had spent millions of dollars on synchronous training. They had asynchronous for two years. And they lost a lot of recruits because they had no feedback, no interaction, no mentor. They changed it up. They had six months synchronous and then three, three weeks face-to-face, -face, crawl, uh, walk, run in the Army. That's what they call it, right? So uh, they switched it up to two weeks async, one week sync. Two weeks async to get some humans in, in, embedded, some human element embedded in all this. But they had some very sophisticated stuff a decade Would ago. Would you like to play a game of chess? I play very well. Yeah, shovelware. But a lot of it was shovelware, just putting stuff up on the web. Ten years later, I feel a lot better. I feel much better now. Okay. So let's look at technologies today. What's in front of us today? We got robots in Korea teaching English. As I walk around different places in Korea, robots. And of course, they bring a lot of people from the US to teach English as well. We've got people recording my talks with live scribe pens, where you click on the pen, you hear the notes. I had one guy stalking me for a while, coming to all my talks. <laughs> a guy from DePaul University in Chicago named James Moore. He's coming to all my talks. Anyone got a live scribe pen? A couple of you recording this one? We've got you know, exercise machines at Cleveland State University where you can do a workout and learn at the same time. You got Steve Jobs giving his famous commencement speech at Stanford in English Central and you can hear your speech compared to his. It'll, it'll compare it. Or Angelina Jolie if you want to compare it to Angelina Jolie. We've got Chinese pod, English pod, Spanish pod, all free to the world. 300,000 people a month downloading Chinese pod stuff. Some technologies wrapped around us. Inexpensive netbooks and laptops. Whether we're in the US or in Bhutan, like these kids there, or in Peru, um, these $100 laptops or $50 laptop computers, soon $10. Today, my newspaper had an ad about um, the $25 tablet that the Indian people in India have created. Again, language learning has exploded the past, past few years. Live Mocha, two, 2 million people learning to t take a language or teach. You can send to take or teach with free lessons. Mixer. Um, can talk, uh, Chinese pod, English pod, all sorts of websites, uh, Palabia, Babel, italki. Tablet computers, as I said, in, in India they say, you know, $35 and that's too expensive. Their goal is $10 for a tablet computer. That's the goal for, a, for an iPad-like device in India, exploding around us all over today. And in Korea and China, pocket dictionaries, pocket dictionaries so that you know, when I was giving a talk, people are pulling these out last month. They're pulling out, looking up words. In the U.S., we haven't had this yet. It's not, we've not experienced it. And they want, in Korea, by 2015, to have all books free, digital books for K-12, with simulations, animations, thesauruses, dictionaries, questions to the instructor, reference materials. That's the goal in Korea. And Monday, back in Indiana, I have one of the developers coming to speak to our campus about this project. Uh, Korea's won California. When the governor of California was leaving office, he was trying to reduce their big budget deficit. And he was trying to do that through e-books. So California, Korea, Canada is the other place to look at e-books exploding there. Uh, video conferencing has exploded. And I'm, stu I'm studying shared online video. Why do people sh um, share video, create video? And tomorrow I might start with that with our workshop about shared online video. But we've got you know, uh, all these websites, uh, Yahoo and Hula and Google and, and um, places, uh, you know, e uh, YouTube, e YouTube EDU, Howcast, Wonder How To, Big Think, all these websites with free video being shared. Okay? National Geographic, Earthwatch, all sorts of websites, Smithsonian's. Videos exploding. Now we got webcams on our, you know, iPhone. You can do, you know, video conferencing kinds of things. Skype for the iPhone was announced December. February 28th, group video chat with Socialize. I love that name, Socialize. We socialize with our eyes. Google Hangouts, Google Plus. So we've got, we've got video wrapped around Google. But not to be outdone, a couple days later, so this is June, July, 
what do we have? We've got Facebook announcing Skype embedded within it. So video has exploded. There's one, one thing that's happened is video, another is ebooks. Since my word is open book came out, these two things have happened. Shared online video, we got Michelle Ray, who tra tried to transform DC schools before the mayor was fired and she was fired. You got Howard Gardner, the famous multiple intelligence guy, asking her questions in Fora TV, free Fora TV, TV lesson. I had a student from Mongolia call me. She says, Dr. Bonk, I'm enrolling in your, pro I'm applying for your program, blah, blah, blah. She called me a couple years ago. She says, by the way, have you seen TV lesson? We've got H1N1 outbreak here in Mongolia and we're all watching TV lesson. Wow, I never even heard of TV lesson. We've got, um, TED Talks, you've all seen TED Talks, some of the best lectures in the world, talks, uh, Academic Earth. The people at Academic Earth have tried creating a portal of all the free lectures of Harvard, Stanford, and Tufts, and Johns Hopkins, and Indiana, and, and, and University of Maryland, all these in Academic Earth. Um, for a TV, as I mentioned. Social network gaming. Now my son used to play Halo. How many of you have sons or daughters that played Halo? Bang them up, shoot them up, Grand Theft Auto? He's 23, turning 24 next week. He said, Alex, now you've graduated from IU, what, do you, what games are you playing? He said, uh, we're playing Halo, and we're helping other people grow plants and crops. You know, we've, we've grown from a time of Grand Theft Auto and bang them up, shoot them up. Um, actually, he said, we're, we're playing Farmville. So we're playing Farmville instead of Halo. And you've gone from this time, you know, where we're worried about our kids blowing people up every night, and now they're doing budget management and they're helping people out with their with their finances and their crop management and so forth in Cityville and Frontierville. Ebook readers. Now the Kindle had a price at one point. It's, look how it's coming down to near zero. If Jeff Bezos was smart, he'd just give away the Kindle. He can't compete with the iPad and the Nook and other things. Well, maybe he can. He's come out with a new reader, right? He's come out with his own ta uh, tablet device last week, right? but he might just give away the Kindle. World Reader, one of his employees left, one of his managers left a few months ago to create the World Reader for people in third world countries. Okay, another trend, August 22nd, this is last month's news. This is one of the device, a preliminary beta version of this device. So kids around the world can have these millions of books that are now free, that have been scanned by Google, been scanned by other companies, been scanned by the Internet Archive and others. Intelligent Computers, the Watson competing on Jeopardy taking four years to build the Watson, six million years to build our brains, okay? Now Stanford is pu pushing out a course this semester on AI, artificial intelligence, and you know, the New York Times had an article on it, the Chronicle of Higher Ed had an article. They've got 135,000 people signed up for this free class at Stanford where you can take the tests, you can get a certificate of completion, not credit, but you know, uh, when I was a grad student, I invested all my money in the 1980s in AI companies, Symbolics and other ones, and they all went under due to ethical practices and problems. They overpromised and underdelivered in the 80s in AI, but now we're making, it's making a comeback. So trend number nine is AI. Trend number 10, interfaces. Whether we have GUI, hands-on interfaces with your iPad and iTouches, and eventually telekinesis. There's already cars where you can control your car with your brains. Imagine controlling your kids and your students that way <laughs> in 20 years. Some of you already try, I'm sure. Mobile apps, whether we're learning, like my friend Bob Johnson, you can barely see Bob there down in Louisiana at the airport, right? Or we're learning on a train or on the plane. We're learning all the time. Learning's in front of us all the time. Augmented reality, lenswear, fixing helicopters with schematics coming across with interactive lenswear. Language translation tools, so if you get something in Swedish or Norwegian, you can, you can turn it into English or vice versa. Using these language translation tools, Bing's got one. You can have these world lens tools where you can hold up your iPad or iPhone over the top of signs and it will translate them for you. Or you can translate, you know, um, you want to order Indian food and uh, get some hot and spicy food, some curry or whatever, you can actually talk to the guys in Indian and Hindi, right? You can have your little device interpreting what he's saying and speak it back, type in something, have it speak it back. Yesterday in um, the news in USA Today, Apple was announcing voice recognition coming on this, these new iPhones. Not full scale, but at least these are, these are, they said the fourth inning of a nine inning game. They're getting there. It's coming soon, and this is where we're gonna need these for filtering all this information coming across language translation tools. So we don't get in accidents on the way here. Portals, 
The fifth opener in my world is open book is about portals on the web. Whether we're talking about Google having a portal of art, the MoMA, or the Louvois, or the, you know, go to the Van Gogh Museum in the Netherlands, whatever, the British Library. They have a portal of, of digital museums around the world. So portals, whether it's Shakespeare, Einstein, Hemingway, Jane Austen, portals on, of people. Or one person creating a portal in a content area. This person from the University of Idaho created a portal on mammals of North America. They came live a month ago. And I went and I played around with it um, a couple weeks ago. It's fascinating. One person can make their difference and change the world with a portal. So those are 14 different technologies wrapped around us. So question, what is the web? Is the web an entertainment system? Is it a, um, a place to communicate with your friends? Is it a writing aid? What is it? I think it's a learning tool. And I think it's time is ripe for changing the name of the web to the web of learning. We're learning all the time with this interactive web wrapped around us. And what's wrapped around us? We've got all these web 2.0 technologies. We've got podcasts and wikis and so forth, live journal, Ning. Um, we've got social bookmarking, video conferencing, all these things wrapped around us. We're at the web of learning. We're at a jumping off point today in this web of learning. And dare I ask, can we all stand with me? We'll get an attempt here. Everyone stand up. We're at a jumping off point here today. We don't know where we're going. Where are we headed? Ladies, on the count of three, can you all jump with me? One, two, three, jump. Men, can you do better? One, two, three, jump. No, they didn't. Men, try this again. One, two, three, jump. Ladies, you got to show them how. Everyone together. One, two, three, jump. Thank you, ladies. You hey, guys have a seat. Oh, guys, I don't know. I'm not taking any of you on the basketball court unless you're on the other team. So we're at this jumping off point. We're at the, the verge of going to the library 2.0, the university 2.0, the corporate training center 2.0, school 2.0. We're moving in a direction, but we need a strategic plan. We need to think ahead about where we're going in all this. Is the world flat like Thomas Friedman says? You know, you can learn from his book with a playaway device and listen to it while you jog. You can learn in your car on CD. You can watch him being interviewed by Charlie Rose on YouTube. You can learn from in all sorts of ways. MIT world, you can hear his talk at MIT. Many ways to learn that book without even reading it. I don't read books anymore. I get them on tape. I listen to them in my car. And if I like it enough, then I get the physical book and read it through. Is the world curved? My friend David Smick here in D.C. area says the world's curved. Look at the hedge funds, 401ks the last couple of years. And as a former accountant, I can say that this book is complex. It took me two reads to get through it and still don't understand half of it. How many of you have seen this book, The World is Curved? Is the world spiky? Richard Florida uh, from Canada. He's got the wrong name, Richard Florida, living in Canada. But he um, says the world's spiky. We got these innovation centers in Seoul, Korea, in London, in Austin, in D.C in Austin, Texas, in Seattle. The world's spiky. I say the world's open. And there's a free book called Opening Up Education you can download from MIT Press, an edited book. The world's become open for learning. And I've got everyone greeting me when I go to Korea at Ewa Women's. And now I know why Miu Young wanted to go to Ewa Women's. It's all the women there. Um, I go to all the universities. They're all going like this as I enter. And as I go to different places in Saudi Arabia, in uh, Malaysia, and in Thailand, in in uh, Korea, in the UAE, people are greeting me like this. Now the kid, the Korean kid with his hands up, that's my son, he's not quite convinced. <laughs> but you know, people think the world's open. In Norway, that vice admiral in the Norwegian uh, Navy, she's got her arms up in the air. And people are coming from the Philippines over webcam. Everyone thinks the world's become open for learning. These are the 10 trends that my World is Open book, um, and I'll give away one copy of the World is Open book for a question here, um, I kind of indicate are changing the world. If just one of these trends had happened, this would be a revolution in learning. The fact is that all these 10 trends have converged simultaneously to change the possibilities for learning today. Web searching in the world of e-books, e-learning and blended learning, that's we. Availability of open source and free stuff. And um, you know, they said if I said free five times in this talk, I'd get good evaluations. So free, 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 free. Leveraging resources, open courseware from MIT, learning object repositories and portals, the all. Then we get into the good stuff, learners participating. Wikipedia and YouTube and Dig and Slashdot in the news, in wikis and so forth, adding to the web, not just browsing the web. This is just stuff on the web. 
this is stuff up there. This is stuff we're doing, electronic collaboration, alternative reality, mobile learning, and personalized learning. We all learn, okay? So a little audience participation. Ladies will be the we, men will be the all. Together we'll say learn. On the count of three, ladies will say we with me. One, two, three, we, we. all. Men try that again. All <laughs> learn. Okay, let's try this again. One, two, three, we, we. all learn. They're trainable here, Greg. They're trainable. So Friedman had his three Ps. He had new participants from Eastern Bloc countries of Europe and China and India. He had an equalized playing field brought on by collaborative technologies and management processes have been flattened. In education, we have a different set of Ps. We have new piping. Some of you are checking your email and Facebook while you're here, right? Admit it, you're in the back. How many people are checking their Facebook since they've been in here? Okay, they're in the back usually, right? Uh, pages of content, free stuff, right? Free stuff. Uh, 52 trillion pages on the web. You don't need all 52 trillion to be high quality. You need to find 20 good high quality sites. That's it for each discipline and we'd be happy and content. United Nations Digital Library, peer reviewed. British Library, turning the pages. I'll talk about some of these things tomorrow. The original works of Beethoven, Mozart, Einstein, Jane Austen. You can turn the Magna Carta pages, hear what was happening at the time with audio files. You don't need everything to be that quality. We need just 20 things in each discipline. Participatory learning culture, those three Ps are changing everything. As a part of that, we have new delivery mechanisms coming at us every day. Now, tomorrow I'm gonna go through my current book I'm working on, on Motivation Online. I'm working on a 100 activities book with these 10 principles, tone or climate, encouragement, feedback. Maslow said we need a safe tone or climate. B.F. Skinner said feedback and responsiveness. Thomas Malone in the gaming literature said curiosity and fun. Variety, autonomy and choice and flexibility, relevance, meaningful, interactive, engaging, tension, Piaget said challenge, and yielding products. These 10 trends spell tech variety. I'm gonna have a 100 activities book and tomorrow I'm gonna to go through a couple dozen activities with you in the morning session. I'll also go through my R2D2 book. We're gonna give a couple copies away here at the end of the R2D2 Empowering Online Learning Book. Everyone coming tomorrow will get a free book, I think. Uh, read, reflect, display, and do, R2-D2, it's a problem-solving wheel. You can basically fit everything you can do on the web into these four quadrants, reading activities, reflection activities, writing, displaying your knowledge visually, and doing something with it. And basically, we are going insane trying to keep up. This model, the tech variety model, and the we all learn model are three ways to make sense of the web, of what's possible on the web today. It's cuts or slices. This is more for motivation, okay? We all learn is more for strategic planning. This is more for looking at learning styles or really more for diverse learning. I don't believe in learning styles. I'm trained as an educational psychologist. After I was a, an accountant, no one believes in learning styles as an educational psychologist. It doesn't hold water. As an instructor, we all believe in learning styles. It makes a lot of sense as a teacher but the, there's a lot of lack of credibility and validity for most measures, but it makes a lot of sense to reflect on your teaching, and that's what this is attempting to do. It's getting us to think about how to address students' diverse needs on the web. Yeah, here, my little friend. You know, that little droid's gonna cost me a lot of trouble. Oh, he excels at that, sir. You cannot escape your destiny. So the first one we'll get into tomorrow is auditory learners. I'll give you some examples of how to address the auditory learning of the first part. This talk is gonna be about my fourth framework. So we're finally getting to that. It'll take me about 15 minutes to go through this. We'll have 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, this framework is a simple one. It's where, where I'm headed in terms of extreme learning. I'm gonna give you 13 examples, simple ones about blended learning, and 13 about transformative learning, tottering, and 13 examples for extreme learning. If monkeys can be teaching via blended, so can you. Tinkering. Tinker with your class. Most people can tinker. What about Bob, the movie? You know, got Bob to take baby steps. Remember Bill Murray taking baby steps? Most instructors are willing to do a little bit with supplementing their class with, with resources on the web, with articles on the web, with discussions on the web, maybe an animation. Just small little tinkerings that we're doing with our classes. A chat maybe with a guest author? Mm, might be a little more difficult. If I had an internet connection, I'd show you this accounting example. My friend here from Franklin University, teaches forensic accounting. He has some cost uh, variables, variable costs and fixed cost scenarios which he gives to students and they deal with, they interact with them about. He also displays a, um, an interview that a forensic accountant might do in tracking some fraud within a company. 
So video scenario, counting, learning, preparing students for the real world, getting them embedded in real world case situations, putting your courses up in a video lecture, capturing lecture online, putting them up uh, using Tegrity, Echo 360, Media Site Live, or some other technologies. How many of you have put lectures up on the web? How many of you have done case-based learning online? How many of you have done chats with authors on the web? How many of you have done, uh, what else, uh, simulations or animations kind of activities? Medical people maybe, possibly, right? Timeline tools, I was going to show you, I was here today, I was, this afternoon, I was at the memorial there for Martin Luther King, and as you click on this timeline tool, and again, I'm not going to click for this because we saw what happened earlier, but as you click along this timeline, this move, this actual rock, as you click on it, moves up and it explains what, what uh, is there when you go there. It explains dates, there are dates and time of Martin Luther King, and it explains what he was doing at different points in time. Timelines can encapsulate disciplines, as I said earlier, whether it's his people in history, um, or it's you know, new technologies in computer science, exploring Bill Gates' life on a timeline as he retires. The New York Times, USA Today, Washington Post are very good about putting up timeline tools that are free to the world. So you don't have to create all these. Again, Steve Jobs' life, August 24th, they put one up. And now, here we are a month and a half later, they had to change that timeline tool. Simulations and animations online. At Stanford, they have the Folded tool. Now, the Folded tool at Stanford lets you see how Alzheimer's unfolds or um, AIDS. Okay, it's a, it's a free uh, animation, simulation kind of tool. Um, at Indiana, we have a um, professor who teaches human embryology, Valerie O'Loughlin. And my daughter came home last summer and says, Dad, I'm taking this course with Valerie O'Loughlin. I says, yeah, she's spoken in my class before. Well, she's got these videos up and you can, these animations, you know, the, of uh, babies and, and forming and blah, 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 blah. And I can take tests wrapped around it and learn the content on my own. And I said, yep, she showed that in my class a couple years ago. But, you know, this is self-paced material. Students want to know if they know the content before they take their exam. So all this is, is freely available. It's tinkering with your class, adding little things. You can see gastric bypass surgery or whatever it is you're, you know, you're doing or um, in, your, in your classes on the web. Collaborative groups, whether we're in Ning. Now, you might have heard of Ning, built by Mark Andreessen, who brought us Netscape. It was free. It now costs a little bit, but still useful. Over a million groups in Ning, where people can share videos and resources and have discussions and so forth. Um, Google Groups, Yahoo Groups, there's all sorts of groups online. Uh, and Google Documents, how many use Google Documents? You're tinkering with your class, it's almost transforming, but tinkering. Students can work in small teams with Google Docs, discussing their papers, sharing them. That was my research a decade or two ago. We actually, in 1991, did a national survey on the state of collaborative technology. Uh, and we're not much far beyond where we were in 1991 today. What we could do with tools like Aspects and Collaborative Writer with Macintoshes was fascinating in 1990 and 91. We have not gone beyond that all that much, but Google Docs is a step up. Wiki, wiki uh, Spaces, PBWiki, doing wikis for collaborative learning. My students write wiki books with students from China, Malaysia, and so forth, and we'll talk about that tomorrow as well. Um, Case-based learning. At Indiana, we've got an MBA program. It's gone from 12 students online in 1998 to 1,700 today at $70,000 $70, a student. That's 70 million of new money, more than that, in the last 10 years. They do a lot of role play, case-based learning, court forums, and so forth on the web. Psychology experiments online, gestalt experiments, right, perception tests on the web. Any psychology professors here? There's a lot in psychology on, on the web. Uh, readings, just putting up articles to listen to. Open access journals have exploded during the past few years. And so we have you know, journals that many of us today try and publish in so anyone can read these. In my field, the International Review of Research and Open Distance Learning out of Athabasca in Canada, it's very widely read. In fact, they put up an audio file. They put up an HTML file. They put up a PDF of every article. And I said, why are you putting up an audio file? So we have two audiences, people who are visually impaired and people in Africa. So what are people in Africa? They're putting it on the radio. People in barbershops are listening to research on educational technology throughout Ghana and Kenya and other countries in Africa. 
You're like, wow, so my articles are being listened to in the barber shops of Kenya, but nobody's reading them here in the US. <laughs> my friend Brian Ford here, and I was gonna show Brian. Um, Brian's writing a book now on the intelligence of a cell. He watches how cells make decisions. He just had a book come out on the future of meat. It's the most popular books on the secret weapons of Nazi Germany. Um, he's now got a new version of it coming out, Biological Weapons. Well, he's a BBC TV and radio personality, and he's put up 40 years of his biology experiments on the web last month, all free to the world. You can track the life of a scientist. You can track the life of a mathematician. You can track the life of an athlete. Track the life of a medical doctor. All on the web today. Students can get excited about becoming a biologist, about becoming a mathematician, about becoming a psychologist. That's the power of the web. You see, these are real people. It's not just reading books and articles. You get a sense of the real, and in Brian's case, you can write to him. He's got a Facebook account. He's got a Twitter feed. You know, you can connect to him in LinkedIn. Ask him questions. As I mentioned, the United Nations Digital Library, Cultures of the World. You want to get uh, information about Asia, in particular Korea? Boom, you've got images, text, videos. Six years to peer review this website, now free to the world. You got the Turning the Pages website from the British Library where you can open up the real pages of, as I said, Mozart and Beethoven and the Magna Carta and get audio files explaining what they were doing. So people talk about the content that's low quality. How about point them to what UNESCO is doing, United Nations is doing, British Library is doing, the MoMA is doing, Smithsonian is doing. Um, all these, you know, it's NASA exploding stuff off of, well, I shouldn't say the exploding, a lot of interesting stuff at NASA. In the corporate space, Grant Thornton. Any corporate people in here today? Yeah. Grant Thornton does a lot of stuff today where it's on-demand learning, video training on your iPhone or iPad or on your desktop. Small bits of learning nuggets coming at you uh, in virtual spaces. Business podcasting, having students listen to Wall Street Journal reports for, bus from, for the business field, for teaching accounting or finance. At IU, our MBA program puts up podcasts to get students interested in becoming MBAs. They put up a whole series of programs to attract people into the field. Scenario learning, to see what's happening at Krispy Kreme or Coca-Cola or whatever and having case problems wrapped around it with questions and so forth. So those are 13 for tinkering. I'm gonna show you 13 for tottering, 13 for transforming and then I'll field some questions. Tottering. Getting us pushed out a little further. Tinkering, yeah, we can do some of those things. I can use animations, I can put an online audio file or article, but how about bringing in an expert from another country? I can bring in Don Tapscott from Canada who has a book called Grown Up Digital, Growing Up Digital and Wikinomics. You may have heard of Wikinomics. I can bring in Tian Belawadi from the Open U of Indonesia. Short little lady, she's in charge of 600,000 students at the Open U of Indonesia. I can bring in George Siemens who has a new theory called connectivism. Boom, he's in my class talking about his theory. My students just read about it. I can bring in um, Stephen Downs from the Canadian Research Council, the top blogging person in education space with his kitty cat there. I can bring in someone from Antarctica studying penguin populations. Uh, I can bring in people from Japan talking about the use of wikis to teach English. I can have video conferencing with people in remote lands. I can have video conference with students at the University of Houston while we work on projects together, critiques and books together. I can bring in the owner of Chinese Pod, Ken Carroll, to talk about the teaching of English in China and how it's exploded. The teaching of Chinese in the US and how it's exploded through English Pod and Chinese Pod. I can have my friend there, Sarah Robbins, known as IntelliGirl, come into my class. She has a book called Second Life for Dummies. And um, I put on my pink wig too. She lives two blocks from me by bringing her in virtually anyways. Okay, it makes a good presence anyhow. I bring the IntelliGirl in. I bring in the most famous instructional designer in the world, David Merrill. David Merrill, my students hate his articles. They bash his articles. They discuss them all week asynchronously. Then we bring them in live. They agree with everything he has to say. <laughs> it happens, it, it's, a, it's a top 10. I brought in Elliot Soloway from Michigan in 1995. My president, Miles Brand, the former head of the NCAA, the guy who fired Bobby Knight. Don't bring, him, don't bring in Elliot Soloway. You're gonna bring down the internet. We had 15 people in the course. 1995, we're gonna bring down the internet combining CUC me and picture tell. In 2009, Oprah Winfrey taught two million people on the web and 700,000 simultaneous downloads and no one blinked. 
we've come a long way since 1995. Come a long ways. And, you know, 1995, I did. I combined PictureTel, CUC, me. We had two video conferencing systems together. We brought in experts. My students read their articles all week on how computer programming impacts thinking. They hated them. They bashed them. We brought them in live. They agreed with everything they had to say. Async first, then sync. It always works. Multi-site. These students at William & Mary brought me in. I looked at them a little cross-eyed there, then a little normal. Um, that was earlier this uh, March. And in May, I visited their campus, and they all went to dinner with me. So we did async, we did sync, and then we did another sync. We did live. But multi-site. They had students all over the world, and they had students on site there at, in Williamsburg. As I said, online language learning. Many uh, of us are teaching our, our languages. Any language instructors here? Teaching language? I'll skip that then. Wikis. My friend Ron Ostin at York University has his students design the syllabus in a wiki with him. He has his students design the weekly agenda with him in a wiki. My students do wiki books with students around the world. They're actually, Wikipedia has a wiki books website you might want to check out. My former student, Teresa, has her students sing Beatles song to learn English back in Taiwan. She has, teaches engineers English. So she has them do their own podcast shows singing Beatles songs tottering with her course. My student Justin said, Dr. Bonk, I don't want to just do a blog this semester. I'm going to do a video blog. He's an ambitious guy. So go for it. Now I'm having all my students do video blog posts. Michigan. Professors in dentistry at Michigan teach their lectures. They record them as podcasts. So everybody, every course at Michigan is a podcast. So what that means is, as people move to the DC, Baltimore area to become dentists from Michigan, you don't want them. You don't want a dentist trained through podcasts. You want to train someone can, you know, this is supplemental resources. One of my students last semester said, Dr. Bonk, I'm going to upload my final project as a mobile book for anyone around the world. I found this website called Book Ricks, and I said, go for it. She actually is in the D.C. area. Um, I forgot to mention his name's Nicole Hatch. And Nicole put her book up, and I'm like, wow, this is great. I might do this for the future, have students put up their work. That way the audience extends beyond the instructor. They can put their chapters or whatever up in a free mobile app. Simulation games. Students, you know, many army recruits are doing simulations before going to Iraq and Afghanistan to increase their skill base. Film festivals at Deloitte. What's your Deloitte? As a retention tool, as a recruitment tool, people at Deloitte now put videos up every year. They have a competition. They have a film guy who promotes this, a competition, the film festival guy. Accountants can be creative. I didn't know that, but they can be. <laughs> healthcare. University of Texas at Austin has healthcare online. Lots of things are happening online in islands. They can practice their CPR skills. Nurses can practice that as well. They can uh, simulate a heart murmur or whatever it is they're trying to do. So those are 13 ideas for tottering. Now how about totally extreme forms of learning, the last 13 that we have here. And again, I apologize earlier for the computer, whatever happened earlier, I'm not sure what, what it was. But today, you see, anyone can learn anything from anyone else at any time. And I can be an armchair Indiana Jones <laughs> in Bloomington, Indiana. And in fact, in my World is Open book, I start with a blog from someone who's studying First Nation people as part of the UCLA Summer Digs project. Extreme learning. This gentleman here found or bought the missing link. His research article came out in the Public Library of Science on May 20th, 2009. The same day I came home from Korea two years ago. I was in Korea a couple times the past year. Came home, I was in the Indianapolis airport and bought the book, The Link. I came home, went to the website and saw Sir David Attenborough give a speech explaining the link. I could download the free research article. Science was immediate. The same day that the research got out explaining this for scientists, kids in schools could find out about it. I could find out about it as a common person on the streets. I knew nothing about this, but I could get the book, the research article, watch the video, get the still images, immediate science, live science. This guy found the Titanic. He now has the Nautilus Live going around the world, finding things species, new species, and explaining them to people around the world, live with scientists on board. We've got individuals slicing and dicing brains of people who had epilepsy and part of their brain removed, and then showcasing what it is or showing what it is they found when their brains have been donated to science. We've got people finding gigantic or colossal squids and finding out it has eyeballs the size of soccer balls and claws that can bring down ships and translucent bodies 
well, two out of three. Anyhow, it, you know, and this, no one knew anything about colossal squids, really, until you know, this largest mollusk in the world was found in Antarctic waters by mistake. We've got Lily Henry Roberts right there. She opens My World is Open book. She's a rugby player at UCLA. And I'm learning from her as an armchair Indiana Jones. I'm asking her questions because it's being blog posted to the world. Her digs of First Nation people in Hope, British Columbia from 12,000 years ago, along with Albania, along with people in Chile, along with people in Mexico and Peru. All this is free on the web. They're getting 12 to 15 credits and all of you can sign up. You don't have to be part of UCLA to sign up. Anybody in the world can sign up to be part of this, you see. Extreme learning. Guy going around North America to South America on a bicycle. We've got Jessica Watson going around the world on a boat, the youngest solo sailor. At first, we had a couple guys tra uh, racing last year, Michael Perm and David uh, Zach Sutherland. And then a woman from Australia beat them. We got my friend, Aaron Daring, going by snow sled to northern parts of Canada, to Baffin Islands and Greenland as part of a National Geographic project funded in DC. Uh, and now they have Earth Education to make people aware of environmental issues. We've got adventure learning happening, and my research team is looking at the learning impact of adventure learning. We've got my friend Cassandra Brooks studying the Chilean sea bass, known as, uh, also known as the Antarctic toothfish. She's seeing it being fished out, and her master's thesis is all about this. And she's now created the lastoceanproject.org and Shark Theater. Shark Theater, she takes the island populations in Polynesia and in the Caribbean. Big shark, 24-foot uh, inflatable TV screen to teach about depopulation of fish and sharks and other things. People, one person can change the world. We've got this woman creating a website for adults to train kids in math, science, and so forth, adult mentors for kids who lost their parents due to HIV and AIDS in South Africa. You can sign up to become an instructor, okay? Uh, this gentleman here offered a free course this summer on online learning, the future of online learning. His name is Ray Schroeder. 2,000 people took the class. It's called a Massive Open Online Course, or a MOOC. This is exploding like the Stanford with 135,000 people. We have courses where people sign up. I was on the last panel of Ray's class. We got computer game jams. Kids spend a day at Purdue, at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, at you know, Wayne State, wherever in the world. They're competing with each other for one day, creating the best games. We've got Cisco Systems creating teleportic technology, telepresence where you can be looking like you're in the same room and soon holographic images, holodecks and so forth. That actually already exists. You can teleport in instructors in, in contact north in Canada from Toronto to Sioux Lookout Canada, the northern part, it looks like the person's in the room with you. They holographically image someone coming in to people in northern Ontario where they don't have running water, paved roads, but they have a teleported instructor. Pretty cool stuff happening throughout Canada actually. Uh, military mobile, I was going to show this mobile app, um, but uh, here's on-demand learning with your mobile, whether you're in Afghanistan or in Iraq or, where, or Korea, wherever you happen to be. War zones, MBAs I mentioned, learn anywhere, learn anytime I mentioned. Pocket school from Paul Kim, there's Paul. And he has this little pocket school project where he's training people literacy skills wherever they happen to be, self-directed learning kinds of things. The foundation he founded was called Seeds of Empowerment. If you type in Seeds of Empowerment, you can find out all of the projects going on around the world. And again, my son's working on that with him. So is this a revolution? That's the question. How many of you think this is a revolution now? Agree with me? Disagree? Well, okay. Well, I think it is. Who's content? I don't think we can be content at all. There's so much possible that's happening. We can be smiley about what's happened during the past decade, but in no means can we be content about what's in front of us, right? So much more is possible. So much more is coming. And um, if, again, you're interested in gathering the notes for tomorrow, I've already posted them at trainingshare.com. Uh, my papers are up at publicationshare.com. And lots of stuff on the World is Open book. In fact, I'm working on a free book you can go to worldisopen.com and get the prequel and the postscript of the book. So um, that's a lot of stuff in an hour and a half. I apologize for the 10 minute break we had there fixing things. I think it worked out okay. okay. Um, I think you might have notes on your desk, uh, on your tables. If anyone has a question, I'll be giving stuff away that are sitting next to me here. Um, so by all means, we have a microphone here. So we have, a, we have Greg playing Mr. Microphone. 
and um, we have another microphone maybe in back, so we'll run around with questions. If you have a question, go ahead. Hi. Uh, our question is about uh, assessment. How to do assessment with uh, distance learning and stuff like that. So, like, you know, a lot of opportunity for people to learn stuff, but how do I, where I need to assess somebody's knowledge of a subject? How do I tie that into this, or does that have to be separate? How do I do that? Yeah. Uh, in fact, there is an article I've written, by the way, just to back up for a second, to talk about, and I'm going to answer it a diff different way I'm going to answer this. I've written 30 reasons why we share contents, 10 reasons why instructors would share, 10 reasons why an institution would, and 10 reasons why uh, students would use all this free content. So just why is all this free stuff up there? How do we assess it once it's all up there, right? What do we do with it? Um, some of these systems come embedded with assessments. So you have some you know, structured gated exams that might come through. In the, gate, in the case of the Khan Academy, they can point out what questions you got wrong, what ones you got right. So you can point out to the instructor where students are having some difficulties. They can lay out a visual. They can do data mining and map out a visual of the types of problems students are getting incorrect, where they're getting them incorrect for basic math skill kinds of things and basic science. These are th where you have objective kinds of things. They can map those on. So the assessments that they're building are, um, are, are showcasing that and they're giving badges out. Sun, solar system, universe. I don't know if it's that engaging to me, but apparently it's working. Now that's working at the, at the K-12 level. Corporate people are suggesting, in, in, according to the Chronicle of Higher Ed last week, that they're going to be using badges as well. I'm not so sure that will work at the, the university level. But I do think that, that having some basic exams up there and podcasts so that when you bring students into your class setting, you can do problem solving wrapped around that. You can do problem finding activities. You can do case-based learning and scenario-based learning. That's, I think, where we have to head is the higher order thinking skills have to map on over the top. We can't just accept the basic skills as, as the end state. We can't accept talking heads a shared online video as the end all of education, which Bill Gates seems to think is. We have to go beyond build what Bill Gates thinks is high quality education to have it uh, students solving real world problems, making decisions, finding the messiness in data and, and forming hypotheses around it or um, having creative tasks wrapped around it to do more what Bill, Bill, uh, Steve Jobs is doing. And we need to, uh, so Bill Gates will get us to the basics, Steve Jobs gets us to the creative side. We need to move beyond that. So the base exams can do one thing, but problem solving activities, case-based learning. And I had something called the Interplanetary Teacher Learning Exchange, or the title project, where for five years we had teachers around the world writing problems that they experienced. And we had each other solving problems, each other's problems using book concepts. They had to cite the books, cite the concepts, and so really get in and, and globally solve each other's issues and problems. And that was fast. So a global community solving school, in that case it was teacher ed problems. You could do the same with business, social work, any professional discipline you could do that with. That's one example. This is a, this is a longer question. There are four things that come up with online, always. Assessment, copyright, plagiarism, and quality. Those are the four bugaboos anyone's gonna run into. Now in my 27 videos, I point out ways to address um, plagiarism and assessment. So one of the 10 minute ones goes longer into what are, the, what are the types of assessments that you can utilize. I've also developed 35 ways to reduce plagiarism. But as you know, there's a dummy at Michigan who got a degree. The fraternity got him a social security number. They brought him up on stage. They took him to class, face-to-face -face class. and they, So in face-to-face -face classes, there's cheating happening too. They can't eliminate, you can reduce it. So I've come up with 35 ways to reduce it online. I don't have time to go through all 35, but I do have a 10 minute explaining that. Another question. Kurt, speed of assessment, I want to remind everyone there's an evaluation assessment form on your table. And if you fill it out and hand it in, you get a free gift, which is a nice set of earbuds, audio earbuds. Another question. Yeah, Kurt, I had a question. The, the, um, the amount of free information, it, it sounds incredible, and, and it is getting you know, people access to all of this. Where is the compensation going to come from? That's a good question, too. Um, what a lot of people are doing is putting, and I think from a university standpoint, I think putting a course and a certificate up on the web makes a lot of sense. And then the master's degree from Houston, to me, short term, fine. It's a five year program. Beyond that, I don't think it makes any sense at all. And the same with a lot of people. They're putting up, uh, and my friend um, uh, up in Canada, uh, Terry Anderson, has a free book on theory and practice of online learning. And he told me that he normally sells 2,000, 3,000 copies. 
His theory and practice of online learning has been downloaded hundreds of thousands of times. It's free to the world, and you can download it. It's version two. But he's being invited all over the world to speak on it. He's become an international celebrity. So his value in the space out there by having the free book, free content, or a free course, or free contents, you're making a difference. Now, in 1998 to 2005, I was surveying people why they're sharing this free stuff. Why are people creating uh, Linux and, and Apache servers? You know, uh, some people just want to help the world. And, and, and the large majority of people just, they might have a day job they don't like. And so at night, they're, designed, they're putting up some free stuff to help people around the world in an area that's their interest, their hobby. So part of this, people want to, but part of it is for um, getting people interested in your content area. It's a marketing tool for taking your class. Someone in Kansas State last week suggested all instructors should put up a two minute uh, or a one minute or 30 second video on your class. Just sharing a little video clip. Why do we put a syllabus up? Why not put a little video explaining the class? So that's a novel idea, I kind of like that. Um, so as this free content, and, and again, leaving the field of accounting in 1986, we're now 25 years later, the one thing I think that is monumental is the OER, Open Education Resources that's really transformed things. We're now at the next level figuring out what are we gonna do with all this free content? Who's gonna evaluate the quality of the content? How are we gonna use the content? First, we need it up there. We need to experiment. We're only a, probably a decade in since uh, MIT made the announcement they'll put up free stuff. And, um, and so I think now we're at a level, how are we using it? Where are we using it? What's the, what's the smart way to go about this? And sharing with colleagues. So, Merlot has a conference. Merlot is a free website, merlot.org, with 22,000 contents. They have a journal called JOLT, Journal of Online Research and Teaching. They have a newsletter. They have a conference. Go to the conference and share with people about your sharing stuff. Figure out what they're doing. So, um, and, and it's peer reviewed. Merlot stuff has peer reviewed mapped around. So one thing we need is peer review. One thing we need is conferences like that discussing how it's being used and a journal showing how people are using this stuff so we can make sense of all this free content. So this is all um, starting to happen now. Another question? Yeah. To be sure, there is a model which embraces open learning and one that uh, embraces uh, some of the tools that are out there. Um, a lot of college and university administrators, though, favor uh, a model that is server-based and controls access to uh, course materials and so forth through uh, portals like Blackboard and so forth. Um, the advantage to a Blackboard kind of a model is that it being server-based, number one, there's security uh, for the applications that may be uh, housed underneath uh, Blackboard. Uh, but the other thing is that um, uh, there's better control for, uh, you know, for, from an administrative standpoint. Um, also, if there are problems because the end user is working with a shell, there are people behind the scenes providing support. Web 2.0 apps, on the other hand, uh, certainly foster a more open learning environment and um, are the cutting edge kinds of things. Beyond early adopters and other people who are using Web 2.0 apps in the ways that you've talked about this evening, mm -hmm. how do we get administrations who are favoring the first model that I referred to to move more into the, the Web 2.0 apps and the open access kinds of apps in a way that isn't intimidating yeah. for them? You gotta remember, you're talking to someone who's an accountant who has his foot firmly planted in that uh, control side of the fence, and someone teaches Web 2.0, so I'm schizophrenic. Um, you know, I had the same question at Kansas State. Exact same question came up at Kansas State, and it is an important one that Educause and other people are struggling with and working with. How do we get those people that are on the control side to, to embrace or at least think about the Web 2.0 where you're creatively adding to the web and adding to the internet? Uh, a number of ways. Uh, student testimonials about those Web 2.0 classes might, might do a good service. We actually have changed the culture at Indiana where in the summer we have a conference about technology integration on the campus in the middle of our student union with posters of faculty. We've changed the conversation by having mentoring programs. We've changed the conversation by having laptop programs where if you get 16 hours of training, you get a free laptop. If you get, give eight hours of training, you get a laptop computer. 
So it's, it's a structural thing. It's not going to happen immediately, but there's got to be a lot of pieces to a strategic plan in place. We have a number of pieces, best practices up on the web to show what people are doing with wikis, to show what they're doing on the web on, uh, with YouTube, to, to showcase what they're doing with podcasts and so forth. Uh, and, and inviting those instructors in, maybe in for a small session to see the potential of, of these issues. Again, starting small, low risk, low cost, low time. Once you start with those low risk, low cost, low time activities, you can start pushing out to the farther edges of the space. Um, so I, I think it's gotta be, faculty have to be asking for it and students have to be asking for it before it's going to happen. So students already are, faculty are being convinced Five years ago, the faculty were not convinced. Today, they are. They're not throwing tomatoes anymore. Three or four years ago, there was a lot of resistance, and that resistance has gone away. So administrators now are seeing that they can no longer play total control over everything. Some things have to be opened up. Now, conversations have to be formed between people on the, creating those systems, putting those intranet and internet systems in place, the servers, and the people who are the cutting edge as well as the totters, the, the tinkers, the totters, and the totally extreme. You have all three. You have people who are way out there, the pioneers, and you have some people who are being convinced and starting us to transform their class, and other people just tinkering around the edges. All three have, should have a role in, in this. And um, best practice examples are one way um, that we can uh, get some of those ideas across to them. Having them enroll at the University of Phoenix, you can't teach an online class unless you take one. I think that would be good for, we should have a policy for all administrators. You can't administer an online class unless you take one. And so they could see how boring the shovelware kinds of things would be if they locked down everything and how exciting it might be for, you know, to have them sample a couple different types of classes. Have a continuum out there of classes that are locked down and those that are opened up with wikis and have them experience some of that. So nothing like experiential forms of learning. Those are a couple things quickly off the top of my head. It's a, probably a longer beer conversation for later. Another um, question, Kurt? Yeah. I was wondering whether you thought this $10,000 bachelor's degree they're talking about Texas is coming anytime soon? Well, Mike Garn at uh, Southern Region Ed Board is gonna be a speaker along with Barbara Means who has that big report from Stanford. But Mike is gonna give a speech uh, in two weeks from today, I think, at the um, eLearn conference in Hawaii and you all are welcome to attend. He's, his talk is going to be that exact question. In fact, that's the title of his talk. And he believes that, that such a thing can be created, actually. Uh, and and um, he's got 18 states band together for the Southern Region Ed Board discussing how that might uh, happen, how a $10,000 degree could be, I don't want to say band-aided together, but thoughtfully uh, discussed anyhow at this level. I'm not, I'm not convinced myself that it's gonna end up costing 10,000. The $100 laptop costs $200, if you remember, okay? So the $10,000 degree might cost 20,000 or 30,000, but they will find ways to, to effectively reduce costs so you can offload. In fact, you look at IBM's training, they offload their leadership training, three-fourths of it to the web. The last fourth, they come face-to-face -face for human-human. Um, they offloaded three-quarters for human-computer interaction. The Army, uh, the leadership training for National Guard, they've offloaded almost 80% um, to asynchronous student uh, self-paced. They had a lot of dropouts from it, but tweaked it and got it improved. The last three weeks are face-to-face. -face. There are things that can be done within our system to rethink how the basic content's being delivered. I'm a full-on believer that more is more. As you saw with my slides, I don't believe less is more. That's a silly fictional notion that some liberal colleagues have been sharing within education for too long. Um, I think that intensive one-credit courses where you got the basic knowledge facts out there, and that could be self-paced, then we can do problem-based learning on the back end, problem-solving, decision-making things, in, in, in courses where students focus on the discipline uh, and authentic content. I think that's where we should be going. Getting those basics, like the, why is the Khan Academy exciting? Those are basic facts. Get the people to learn basic facts so when they come to college, they've got that, most of that or a lot of that, we can move beyond that. To me, that makes sense. And there'll, there'll be ways to do that increasingly and assess students knowing those basics so now we can move up a notch. That's exciting. My students did work with students in Finland. They said, Dr. Bunk, we look dumb to our foreign peers. They're citing American research. They're citing stuff from, you know, uh, eight, 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 eight years ago. And we're not even reading the book, you know. So um, there are things that you can do to l increase the standards. 
I think every semester I'm putting up better examples for next semester's class. I'm raising the bar every semester. I'm showing the best stuff. I'm also showing non-examples. People worry about low quality. The more you put up prior student work, like the student putting her book up in book rigs, my student doing video blogging and so forth, they're like, wow. You know, um, so we can raise standards, and you can probably raise standards with a lowered cost degree. I think that will happen. I don't think it will cost $10,000, though. 